So good morning. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here to uh, moderate this panel on the future of uh, Latin America. We have an extremely distinguished um, uh, panel, uh, starting with um, President uh, Cartes Jara from Paraguay, who is the Secretary General of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, Angel Gurria, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, Mexico, former Minister of Finance of Mexico, former everything. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Rebecca Greenspan, who's the Secretary General of the um, Ibero-American uh, um, Organization, and um, former Vice President of Costa Rica, former Minister of Everything in Costa Rica. <laughs> uh, and we have uh, Moises Naim, uh, who's a uh, uh, distinguished author and now a uh, uh, television uh, writer and uh, former um, uh, director of uh, Foreign Policy Magazine, uh, um, former Minister of um, Economic Development in Venezuela, uh, and, uh, and uh, senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for <coughs> International Peace. So it's a truly distinguished uh, panel. Latin America is facing a, a set of challenges in, in its future. It, some of them are uh, endogenous, intrinsic, of things that it hasn't done, things that are on its agenda. And some of them are new, associated with a changing uh, economic environment. Uh, um, a couple of years ago, here in Davos, uh, Moises said that uh, Latin America was not competitive even as a threat. Uh, but um, apparently, uh, Trump thinks otherwise, uh, and uh, and and now uh, some some aspects of uh, of um, Latin American development have have become an issue in U.S. domestic policy, and we are going to talk a little bit about that in the course of of uh, the discussion. What uh, how America uh, how Latin America should face that challenge, and what are its options, and so on. So to start us off, I'm going to ask uh, President Cartes. <coughs> uh, uh, Latin America right now is uh, in have, having serious growth problems. There's a recession in, in Brazil. There's a recession in Argentina. Uh, there's an economic catastrophe in Venezuela. There's very low growth in Mexico and Colombia. Uh, but Paraguay has been growing nicely in spite of the fact that it is surrounded by two countries in recession. Um, and you've been able to continue growing your exports, whether it's uh, soybeans, meat, or electricity. And so you're somewhat of an island of stability in a troubled uh, region. Uh, so I want to ask you, uh, what's your secret and can you keep it up? Or what do you need for the region to be like for Paraguay to continue growing? Uh, thank you very much, but I think that there is no secret about it. Um, the last decade, uh, we had a uh, we had a favor win, as we said, and now uh, uh, has really changed. Um, all we have done is 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 take care about our expenses. Um, but the the most important point that I feel in in Paraguay that has, has really changed internally and for outside was the transparency law that we have made. Uh, that give us a, a, a power of that all the, uh, we always talk that the, the, the people is really divorced from governments. And I can feel it from inside the country and outside the country that that is putting us much together. Today in Paraguay, everyone can know how much earns every em public employee, how much expenses, uh, uh, how much money, uh, how much benefits has each one, and that is putting us closer, uh, uh, the, 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 the people with us. Um, there is no miracle. Today the world is changing so much, and there is no other way than we have to go. The normal question, I remember because I came from the private sector, and the usual question was, what's the difference between private sector and public sector? Um, today I'm finding that practically it has to be the same thing. We have to take care about the public uh, sector exactly as we do with the private sector. We have to handle uh, what is not our, the money and, and, the, and the public property, we have to take 
at the same curve than we, we take with, with, with our, with our uh, money. No? Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, Angel, um, uh, you are leading an international organization that's about uh, agreed rules uh, that everybody sort of is supposed to abide by. Uh, we're moving into a dynamic where uh, President Trump seems not to believe so much in rules as in deals and to get the best possible deal for his country at every turn. Um, uh, do you think that international organizations have a role to play in this new world? And um, um, if so, uh, how do you think uh, um, you know, uh, the conflict with these two different views of rules versus deals is going to play out in the coming uh, years? Well, even deals have to be done uh, in the context of uh, minima of rules. Uh, if we don't have rules, we've been, we've been striving to get rules uh, for the last uh, half century. And we've made a lot of progress uh, on trade. We've made rules. Uh, we haven't done very well on investment, by the way. We never really speak anybody of deals about investment. And now more and more uh, deals about trade uh, are deals also about investment because, you know, trade is <coughs> because uh, protection is so nominal protection in terms of tariffs is so low. Mm. Now it's about uh, investor state, now it's about uh, you know, labor, it's about environmental issues, and it's about regulations, 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 whether you know, before or after the, the customs, uh, etc. But uh, in the particular case of our region, I have to say that given this <coughs> new wind, we'll have to see how, how it uh, transforms itself once it's in office, you know, the new, the new administration. Uh, effectively, go back to the drawing board, to the original homework, and say, have we made enough progress in the homework? And the answer is no. The result is, therefore, that this year we shrunk by one, well, last year, one, one, one percent, and this year, we'll be lucky if we get to 1% positive growth. So the region navigated so well during the crisis and then is doing so poorly in the after crisis while the rest of the world is kind of catching up. And then even within the region, uh, there are some countries, you know, uh, countries that uh, are doing uh, uh, still, uh, you know, very... Uh, Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela, Ecuador, which, which are uh, basically... Uh, uh, not growing, and then uh, some countries, uh, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Panama, to a lesser extent, Mexico, that are growing. And what is, like, in you know, a case like Mexico, wh why is it defending itself a little better? Well, because it made these very dramatic reforms, and now it's implementing the reforms. And now it is, in a way, enjoying the result of having taken the reforms. When did it take the reforms? It started four years ago. Now it's a 50-year government in Mexico, and they're starting now. And that's compensating for a bunch of other issues having to do with political issues and the superstructure, and then even the, uh, the, the start of the political season in Mexico about uh, you know, the, the next election, etc. The reforms, in a way, are biting. They're counting, and they're making progress. And they are, as the president of Paraguay just said, we took the reforms, we bit the bullet, we did what had to be done, and now we are enjoying uh, the, the benefit. Now, there are certain things, sir, that I'm just going to say a few words. This is homework. Inequality. Informality. Productivity. Not everything ends with a TTT, but you know, a lot of it does. Uh, the trade-off between productivity and inclusivity, you know, or inclusiveness. Because if we focus only on productivity, we'll get it wrong. If we focus only on inclusion, it's not going to be enough. So the nexus between the two is absolutely uh, fundamental. How about integration with itself? I mean, we've made more progress in the Alliance for the Pacific in the last two years or three years between Peru and Mexico and Colombia and Chile, 
than with all the Aladi and Alauk and the this and the that and the that, you know, for 50 years. Uh, why? Well, there was a need, there was an opportunity, there was leadership, there was a political courage, and so integration. Now, how about innovation? Another word. We're spending about half a percent, half a percent, 0 0.7 at most, in innovation. The average of the OECD is 2.5%, moving to 3. Average in Sweden is 3.5%, moving to 4. Average in Korea is 4%, moving to 4.5%. We are competing with countries like Korea. The gap is three points of their respective GDPs per year, and that just you know, so what are we? We're going to become employees in the Koreans. You know, I don't know. Just, just uh, who is spending on, you know, who is spending on the... In the value-added change, it is, of course, the knowledge that takes the, the, big, mm -hmm. the big chunk of the value-added. So skills, skills, skills. Why? Because productivity has dropped become negative in many of the countries, only starting to resurface in some of the countries, but productivity is a problem in every single major country in the world, but also in our region. And if we do not improve the skills, we're not going to have uh, an improvement in productivity. Uh, taxation, sir, obviously, yes, but why also? It's not just a question of, well, in, in the incentives for productivity. In, with the enormous inequality, that was one of the first words I said, in Europe, in the United States, you apply taxes, you, you apply social security contributions, you reduce the original inequality by half. In Latin America, you apply the taxes, and you apply the social contributions, and it's like Johnny Walker, you know, sigue tan campante. It just... Uh, you know, delighted. No effect. 3% reduction, maybe, in the genie rather than half. Okay? So, again, that is a very, very uh, serious uh, structural change. Okay. So, so, let me just uh, finish yeah, uh, with one issue that has to do with the last part institutions. And when you talk about institutions, things like integrity, transparency, and the fight against corruption. Why? Because what we have is not only low growth, high unemployment, growing inequalities, but a crisis of trust. Thank you very much. So uh, there was a long smorgasbord of problems and goals. Very good. Um, uh, let me ask uh, um, uh, Rebecca. Um, and policy recommendations. And yeah, well, uh, titles of policy recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> Um, le, uh, let me ask um, Rebecca, um, uh, you know, you've been organizing these meetings of Latin America where Latin America tries to think about its issues, its goals, its problems. Uh, the Inter uh, the, uh, Ibero American organization includes includes Spain, includes Portugal. It does not include Canada or the U.S., and in that sense, it's different from uh, the OAS. It's different from UNASUR. Um, um, but I would ask you, uh, what are the themes that uh, Latin America should focus on in light of the current uh, environment in which its relations with the North will, will tend to be different? No, thank you. Thank you very much, Ricardo. I think that some of the things have been mentioned, but I, I will try to, to focus on the things we are focusing in the mm -hmm. Ibero-American Summit. And we have put a, 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 a very strong focus on education, and especially on high, higher education. A, and our problem there is the quality of education. It's, it's not only the expansion of education that has been amazingly a, a rapid during the last decade. It's a, a just a, for, for, for the people around us to, to have an idea. A, the population at the university level in Latin America has doubled in the last, in the last uh, decade. And uh, it's not only that it has doubled, but two-thirds of the students that are in higher education 
are first time in their family, still first time in their family, that somebody gets to higher education level. So you have these growing middle classes, emerging middle classes, that have gone to higher education with high expectations of getting a better job, of a, a being included in the mainstream of development, and there can be a frustrated. Their aspirations will be frustrated if we do not, don't do something about the quality of education. Because we know that the return to higher, to, to, a, to a university education is declining in, in the region, precisely because quality has a, been lagging behind. So the division between those that have been there for a long time, uh, those that are from the higher socioeconomic strata of the, of the region, will get the jobs and the good jobs if we don't do something to, show, you know, to, to uh, uh, fight the gap between the quali in, in the quality of education. So we have, we have been saying that the intergenerational transmission of inequality will depend on the quality of education and the access to quality education for, for, the, for the new middle classes, let's say, uh, it, that have been getting there. Now, our second point will be, our second focus will be science and technology, innovation, entrepreneurship, and the focus on youth when we talk about that. And that's the, 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 the report we presented precisely in the, in the summit on you know, focusing on youth, what we have to do is not, is, is true, is not only higher education, uh, 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 but it's also uh, training skills uh, to open up the possibility of investment for the young people, et cetera. So that has been a very important focus of the presidents of, of the summit. And I would say that the third uh, area of focus for us has been a, uh, the, uh, what we have to do in infrastructure and uh, uh, to get into the digital society. Uh, that will be an aspect of competitiveness uh, that is very important for the region. We have to double our investment in, the, in, in infrastructure. We have to go to a more integrated market in terms of the digital investment in the, in the region. So how can we help to do that? And there, it's not only Latin America. There, Spain and Portugal are very important because uh, these are countries that are uh, uh, leading in some of the aspects that we need to get to, but it's also very important in terms of investment because uh, in terms of infrastructure, logistic, uh, the digital economy, those countries are very important for, for Latin America. And Latin America is also investing now uh, in, in the Ibero, Ibero Peninsula. My last point is the whole issue of, of trust that has been brought, the uh, transparency, etc. I think that that is very important because the only way in this atmosphere where we don't have really a, 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 low, a, a wide fiscal space to get this investment done is with public-private asso association partnerships. But the problem is that the citizenship doesn't believe that these partnerships are done for the better, for the good of everybody, <laughs> but these are deals between some in the private sector and some in public sector. And I think that with the scandals that we have been uh, uh, seen in the region with uh, some of the main firms, uh, private firms, uh, that has uh, in, in infrastructure, for example, that is a very important point. So the issue is how do, do we build up again the trust with citizenship, with the right rules and um, uh, controls to really be able to do what we have to do to partner with the private sector, but really fighting corruption and being much more transparent in terms of our institutions and in, in our framework in, uh, of, of, of uh, rules. Thank you very much. Uh, Moises, do you have also a long list of uh, to-dos that uh, you want to share, or do you want to focus on a few that you think are more critical? So I want to talk about two things. Let me invite you to think about the year 2000, and imagine that today we are uh, in the year 2000. And we have this session about the problems of Latin America. And we invite Angel Gurria, 
which uh, point of his list would not have been included in the year 2000? It would have been exactly the same list. And in fact, at some point, I smiled because as he was telling the points, which I impossible to deny that are very important, I smiled because I was anticipating the points. There is a circularity to our conversations about Latin America. It is a frustrating thing for all of us to keep coming to Davos and to other places and recite exactly the same five issues that always are in the list uh, of Latin America. And uh, Angel and others have mentioned them. I'm not denying their importance. Uh, growth anxiety, what are the sources of growth, uh, volatility, uh, and so on, is one. Macro stability, always, and the prescription, you know, be careful about your deficits, be prudent, uh, uh, manage your, com com your exchange rate, and, and so on. Uh, the problem of competitiveness, low productivity, low innovation, bad education, bad infrastructure, um, inequality. Now it's you know now we talk more about inequality because it has become fashionable in the United States and in Europe. Uh, but inequality has always been a big issue for Latin America, and then that brings us to malfunction in democracy, and then the inevitable word appears: institutions. We need to do something with institutions. Nobody knows exactly what that means. Uh, we don't, nobody knows exactly wh how to really strengthen in a permanent, reliable, sturdy way the, the institutions. And then the perennial. Impossible to have a conversation like this uh, without complaining about corruption. Corruption is always there. Is, is, you know, it's part of the, is the conversation. And nothing much happens, except in certain instances on. So that's, so my first point is to make an appeal to see if we can go beyond that circular repetitive list and see if we can be more granular and more specific. Uh, and, and that, of course, brings the, the heterogeneity of Latin America where the conversation at this level uh, does not do a lot of justice to the fact that you have Haiti and Brazil and Mexico and Paraguay in the same conversation and they face very different realities. So that is what we talk, always talk about. I want then to, f to mention what we never talk about, which I think it's a very important issue. And that's this Latin America's peaceful coexistence with murder. Latin America has 31%, uh, uh, Latin America has 8% of the world's population and 31% of the murders. Latin America is the most murderous region in the world. War zones are not as dangerous to human life as Latin America. Uh, that's a, an observation of fact that is undeniable. Some countries are worse than others, but murder, the peaceful coexistence with murder, accepting that it's part of human nature, it's part of the human condition, that there's not much you can do about it because, you know, it's who we are. Well, that's unacceptable, but it has become acceptable in Latin America. Nobody discusses it. The other thing that we need to recognize is that governments cannot do it. It's obvious that Latin American governments don't know and don't care and, or, or don't have the will or don't have the tools or don't have the knowledge or don't have the incentives to really deal with uh, homicide rates. Imagine that Latin America decides that this peaceful coexistence with homicide has to end and uh, design something like the Millennium uh, Development Goals, in which you put numbers. Why don't Latin America decide that in the next five years, the murder rate is going to brought, be brought down to by half? We're talking about tens of thousands of murders of people that, 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 that will be saved. And because governments cannot do it, it has to be a societal project where all of the institutions here, you know, executive powers, uh, the multilateral organizations, the church, the, un the labor unions, the television, the soap opera writers, uh, the, the universities, the military, all decide that this is a very important problem and that the government can, that it cannot be left uh, to the government, that all society has to do something about it. That is not part of the conversation. It has never been part of the conversation. It needs to become part of the conversation. Very good. Um, let, me, let me just mention a couple of the things that uh, are also didn't come up in the list that were sort of like maybe implicit, but they're sort of like front page. Why are countries in the region uh, not growing now? the ones that are not growing. Well, the ones that are not growing are not growing because they were exporting commodities. They, 
They grew while the commodity prices were high. The commodity prices have gone down. And now they cannot keep on growing because there are insufficient exports. So Latin America needs to export. In the rest of the world, a, countries have very specific policies to encourage exports beyond higher education, beyond general things about productivity. They have relatively directed policies. For example, uh, Panama has just invested 7% of GDP in the expansion of the canal. That's a public investment in something related to their core export sector. They've done a lot of policies that are de uh, uh, designed to carve out the space in the export of services. Um, for example, Costa Rica got to uh, move into, into um, um, Intel and into uh, medical equipment devices and so on through a targeted policy on those things. We don't have this sense of urgency that we need to act on the creation, the expansion of export activities. Uh, without that, in the short run, we're not going to grow. In the medium term, we're not going to grow. Second one a topic we have not talked about, we talk about productivity and so on, informality. But one of the things that is critical to the low productivity of Latin America is that we have some of the most inefficient cities ever. Cities that have, you know, the commute times of Latin America are the highest also. And the willingness to put public investment in creating the infrastructure so that commute times are reasonable, well, the fact that we don't have them means that women cannot go to work because somebody has to stay home. Uh, that it means that um, uh, the cost of going to work is enormous, so you might as well work from home in some informal activity. So in, in urbanization, the quality of urban life is something where Latin America has, has uh, been uh, very limited. And the third thing that I think Latin America has been remarkably limited is that everybody complains about skills shortages. Everybody complains about skills shortages. And everybody complains about innovation and entrepreneurship. Now, when you look at the US, 52% of the entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley are foreigners. When you look at Harvard, over half of the professors are foreigners. When you look at Latin America, it has some of the most restrictive immigration policies in the world. Trump would pass Latin American immigration laws. So we are restricting our ability. But he would be admitted? Well, he, <laughs> <laughs> he would love to be as close as, as you know, 3.5% of the world's population was born outside of their home country. 1% of Latin America was born, was born out, uh, outside of their own country. And you have countries like Colombia, where 0.2% of the population was born abroad. And these countries have immigration policies that are more restrictive than countries that are sexy to go to. So uh, part of our skill shortages is our closeness, our, 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 our capacity to, to, to bring people in. And this is cheap. And this is quick, right? So it's something that we are not currently doing. So let me go back to the panel and ask uh, the panel for some quick wins that can be done in Latin America now that don't imply these long-term solutions or things like institutions, but quick wins which are on the table now. I think that the word efficiency is really the most important word that we have to assume. As he said, Moises, probably corruption, we are talking about corruption 50 years ago, but I think it's the, the worst enemy we have. Even when we had a win in favor, now it's worse. But if we are not efficient, efficient uh, today is gonna be uh, much worse than before. Uh, what is doing Paraguay uh, and what are we growing? Because we maintain and we are trying to be more efficient every day. There is a point that I don't want to put away that what he was talking about homicide. And it's not my, it's not my, are not my words, but I remember it. in one meeting, uh, Panama's president says that today in Central America, we are more murders uh, through the narco traffic than in all the wars around the world. And there is a mistake that we have to be uh, 
uh, honest and assume it. Once again, narco traffic is a transnational crime, and we don't assume transnational. Every country is doing his best, but we have to talk between countries and to act because the best crime we have where the homicides are occurring is narco traffic. And we still didn't assume that compromise to face them. But I think the word is efficiency and productivity, skills. We feel that. We are very proud of our population. We got very, uh, many young people. Again, 74% of our population are less than 35 years old. And they need skills. We are very lucky that the industry that are coming into Paraguay, they teach them and our young people learn very fast. But definitely we have to assume that education skills are uh, a, a non tremendous that uh, we have. Uh, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm sorry we're boring, Moises. Uh, but frankly, what he said is pretty dramatic. It's also true, and that is why we have to keep at it. We have to keep repeating these things because they change. The headlines are the same, but the nature and the urgency, because there are some progress, there is some progress, there's, there's some transformation, there are some anti-corruption laws that are put in place, there is some battle against drug traffickers. So, but, uh, you know, we just have to keep integration, you know, the question of productivity, the question of, if we do not attend to the fundamentals, and we have not, because we had a wonderful ride, at least before the crisis hit with the, uh, come, even after the crisis hit, the raw materials kept very high, so we kept the ride going on. And again, every time we've had the ride, we forgot about the fundamentals. And we did not focus on the fundamentals. So but, we must but, come but back, even though they're boring. You're saying, you're saying these are not quick wins. These are long-term processes. I, I want a, some quick wins. Yeah, but I'm, I'm going to say I absolutely don't agree with you that you tell us that there's a quick win idea. I think this is slog. We're gonna slog it. We're gonna, you know, go through it, and you, we just get it's it's ten percent inspiration and ninety percent perspiration, you know, because we know what has to be done, and therefore we go. Now there are things like crime, you know. The, I remember we were asked why was it that in 1968 in France one people died because they were watching the parade from a floor, you know, from a roof and they fell or something like that, and in Mexico, but you know. Of officially, 500 people died, and perhaps more. Malraux said, Parce que au Mexique, la mort était toujours là. <laughs> it's fantastic, you know? But it is also about the nature. There are some of the problems that we're fighting, but also the fact that we are. Now, so I think you said cities, cities, cities. We are the only region in the world where we became fully urbanized without becoming industrialized. Fully urbanized before, before becoming developed. Uh, and what we have is that the cities are part of the problem now because of the sprawl and because of all the, you know, the, the, the human implications, the economic implications, the productivity implications, the services implications of, of cities uh, sprawling. But I would go back to the fundamentals and even peculiar fundamentals. Skills, yes. Innovation, absolutely, but innovation, if badly handled, in the case of countries like Latin America, can fire or, or, or displace 40% of the low-skilled population that we have. You know? mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, how does one deal with things like innovation to make it a leverage for growth and development rather than a threat to the low-skilled uh, working class? Uh, do you have some quick wins? I have some quick wins, but I will make two comments before. One is I don't agree with Moises uh, either. I think that the, the point that Moises made about murders and violence is, is, a, very, is, is a very important one. I, I don't deny it. Uh, most of those murders are between gangs. Uh, you, you, if you think about Caracas, maybe not. But if you think about Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, it's between gangs. When there was a peaceful agreement in between, uh, in Mexico, yes. When, you, when, when Salvador went into a peaceful agreement between gangs, the murder rate just dropped. And when we had laws to contain arms, small arms, also the murder rate dropped. 
but it's very difficult to have a sensible arms uh, laws when you have the frontier in Mexico where you can just get any weapon you want in, in the site of the, of the US. So I go to your point, that is, yeah, we will need more than only our countries to really fight you know, uh, the, the criminal rates in, in Latin America. We need the US and we need to engage with the US in a meaningful uh, conversation. That doesn't seem to be in the agenda, nope. but, <laughs> but that's a very important point. Yes, absolutely. Yes, engagement, 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 okay. absolutely. No, the, the, this is not a quick win, but I, I think that is very important. But you put it like, uh, you know, the whole society has been, um, and I think that the narco traffic and, and, and human traffic is, is a, very, a very difficult transnational crime, and we have to have a much more help also in that transnational setting to really fight crime. But my second point with Moises is that you put like nothing happens since 2000 uh, because we have the same agenda. And it's not true. Let me give you an example. Quality of education has been always important. But in the agenda, quality of education was not really very high. Access to education was very high but not quality of education. Yeah. There was this belief that if you want, first you have access and then you have quality, and now we have to put them together, and we know that. I, I, I really think that your, your very uh, half-empty uh, half uh, glass is a bit biased. But let me go to the quick wins. Gender equity, yeah, give women a chance. In, in Latin America, put them in management positions, really high management positions in the private sector. Uh, give them the same salary for same education with men. And you will have a drop in poverty and much more, a, a, a really hike in productivity. And that's, that's a quick win. That's not so hard to do. You, it's hard culturally, but quick in the sense that you have the talent there, you have the people there, you, you, you have everything you need but you have to take really action for gender equity. Second, second win, mobility. Intra-regional mobility of talent. And that's something we are working on. For students, for firms, for, a, 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 and we call it talent mobility in Ibero-America. That's a very, very high in the agenda. We are working very hard with the migration institutions and with the, with the private and the, in the public sector. I think that we will get something done there. And third, third quick uh, win, the whole investment in infrastructure and logistics, because we know more or less what, what we have to do. We know where to do it. And we know that we have to do it locally. We have to do a lot of investment in cities. And I think that one point that the uh, region has uh, uh, is much better now than it was before is that now we have elected governments at the local level, uh, at the local level. So we have very good leadership also at the city level. So if we are able really to empower the cities to make the investment infrastructure that we need, I think that we can have very quick wins there also. So three things. Thank you. Um, um, Moises, um, I, I'm, I wanna go to the audience, but I'm not going to let you go before you tell us something about uh, some of the lessons that Latin America should take and some of the responsibilities that Latin America should consider uh, regarding uh, the economic and social and political catastrophe in Venezuela. What are the lessons? One of the lessons is that we always uh, think, uh, when, when we say failed state, we think of a very, very, very poor country, probably in, in somewhere in Africa, landlocked, uh, without resources. And here we have a, a very large country, Venezuela, that has the largest reserves of oil in the world, that has all the trappings of modernity, the skyscrapers and, and the infrastructure and banks and everything, and looks like a modern country. But in fact, today, I think objectively, you could say that Venezuela is a failed state. The government, uh, the state, is incapable of uh, uh, discharging the basic functions uh, that a state uh, has to perform. And uh, so that's a surprise, and it's very interesting. 
uh, and sad uh, because it's very difficult to fix. The second um, lesson is that uh, the, the stealthiness of, uh, of autocracy these days, it has become very fashionable even for uh, dictators to try to look like Democrats. That is why Vladimir Putin has elections and has uh, the Duma and has all of the uh, uh, choreography of uh, uh, democracy. But in fact, we know that Russia is a highly, highly centralized autocratic uh, uh, nation. And the same is in Venezuela. For many years, Hugo Chavez got away with the notion that that was a democracy, that elections were being held all the time, that the, uh, the, they had a Congress and the independent media and the independent judiciary, and none of that was true, really. Uh, those were captured, co-opted uh, institutions by the central government that essentially uh, converted Venezuela in what is a post-modern uh, 21st century autocracy that hides uh, behind a mask uh, of democracy. So the stealthiness uh, of autocracy in the 21st century, in a, in, and that's not, not just true in Venezuela. I think we can see it in a lot of countries where democracies, uh, it, it would be hard to really think of them as democracies where the checks and balances uh, and free and fair elections uh, take place, but they get away with being perceived like that. The third and very sad one, of course, is to discover how uh, complacent, indifferent, uh, bystanding is the international community. Uh, if you want to be really, really cynic about Venezuela, Venezuela is undergoing a, 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 human, a humanitarian crisis of the first order. Venezuela belongs with Haiti in terms of uh, the disaster, the human disaster that is taking place. But that is not part of the conversation. That is not known. And if you want to be very cynic, as I was saying, you could argue that Venezuela had the bad luck uh, of having to compete with Syria and the refugee crisis. Uh, if, we, if we did not have Syria and the refugee crisis, perhaps the media and the leaders of the world and of Latin America would uh, uh, have uh, uh, paid more attention to a country where all of this is happening, where they are detaining uh, a political, uh, the political opposition and torturing people, and, uh, and people are literally starving. Um, and, and, and the indifference is especially sad uh, for, uh, for Venezuelans who, who helped uh, other Latin American countries uh, at the time in which they were uh, under uh, dictatorships. And now we see some of them are in government, uh, and we cannot uh, uh, get them to act. Uh, there's a very specific case there, there in, in Chile. Uh, President Bachelet would, would, would be very helpful if she can help free some uh, po political prisoners, uh, some of whom uh, I have to say that Ricardo uh, Hausmann's uh, brother-in-law is in jail, and he's a journalist. His crime is to have posted a video uh, of, uh, of a group of uh, people in, in a village uh, protesting against President Maduro. Next thing that happened, uh, Braulio Hatar, this is his name, uh, has been jailed uh, uh, and, and, and impossible. And, and we have been trying, uh, and, and Ricardo's family has been trying to get uh, people like the Chileans that were given uh, refuge in Venezuela during the worst time. And we have not been able to, to, to mobilize the Latin American community. I'm sorry if I'm being very granular and specific about this, uh, but I think granularity is deserved in this case. Okay, thank you. Um, before we go to the audience, I have uh, one quick win uh, and, and an amazing success story and that has very positive externalities for the region. Uh, Rodrigo Janiot, the Prosecutor General of Brazil, is in the audience. Uh, he's led the car wash investigation in Brazil. Uh, now there's a lot of information coming out about uh, corruption uh, in Latin America in uh, quantities that we would not have imagined before uh, and uh, with detailed information that provides a lot of uh, uh, um, possibilities for the fight in corruption in, in the rest of the region. So I want to ask him to, to say a few words. Thank you, Mr. Hausman, to the opportunity to say 
two words here. My English is very limited, so I will speak in Portuguese, and my colleague uh, helped me in translation. É um desafio institucional em, mo em mo momento de mudança de, de paradigma é, enfrentar uma uma questão jurídica do tamanho da Lava Jato. Sorry, it's a very big challenge for our institution to face uh, those uh, threats in the moment of um, the fight against corruption in Brazil. Aproveitando o que disse um pouco o presidente do Paraguai, o que disse um pouco o senhor secretário-geral da OCDE, acho que o sucesso até agora é, deste, desta, deste caso vai pela afirmação e pela independência do sistema de justiça no Brasil, seja do Ministério Público, seja do Judiciário. Taking in consideration what said Mr. President of Paraguay and Mr. Guria from OECD, um, these uh, achievements of the Brazilian Prosecution Service is due to the independ independence and autonomy of the prosecutors in Brazil and the judges, the courts as well. The Ministry of Public Brazilian trabalha de forma transparent, with integrity e com eficiência na aplicação das normas que dispomos para o combate à corrupção. The prosecutors in Brazil try to work uh, with integrity, transparency uh, to enforce uh, the Brazilian laws and the rule of law in our country. É, dois pontos eu gostaria de ressaltar para é, o poder termos podido caminhar até o presente momento nessa investigação. I would like to stress two main points which allowed us to, to advance in our fight. A independência institucional do Ministério Público Brasileiro. The independence uh, and autonomy of the, the ministry, the, the public uh, prosecution service in Brazil before the government. E a cooperação é, entre os ministérios públicos latino-americanos, e cito um exemplo, o Ministério Público Paraguai, é, uma cooperação intensa que temos, e também no âmbito da Ibero, da, das, dos organismos ibero-americanos, é, é, essa cooperação tem sido intensa, o que tem nos permitido é, evoluir neste caso. Um main important point is the international cooperation between prosecutorial agencies in the region, uh, for example, with uh, Paraguai, Ministério Público Fiscalia de Paraguai, and with the Ibero-American countries, which allow us to, to pursue this uh, aim. E por último, é, a cooperação jurídica internacional, e eu gostaria de ressaltar a cooperação extrema que temos, por exemplo, com o Ministério Público Suíço, que nos permitiu alcançar val é, diversos valores ocultos em contas aqui, Na Suíça. Eu acho que esse em si, é, é, é o segredo do, de termos podido chegar até onde chegamos. Muito obrigado. And uh, last but not least, uh, the importance of international cooperation in legal matters for uh, fight those kinds of crimes uh, and the important role of the public prosecution in Switzerland to help us to find out funds, public funds embezzled and hidden uh, in foreign accounts abroad. Thank you, thank you very much. It, it's been very exciting to watch and it's even very instructive to see how the information generated in Brazil, how different countries respond to it, si se whether puede. they act on it. Si, si se puede. Yes, we can. Very good, very good. A, no, a, 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 a remarkable example in the region. Okay, so let me open up to the audience. Uh, let me see. Uh, so let me start over there. Can you present yourself and address? Hazem Galal from PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, I want to follow up on the, the point about devolution of power to cities and mayors. 
I mean, there are some bright spots like Medellin, like, Para, uh, like uh, Maringa in Brazil. And I want some feedback from the panel about giving more budgetary powers to the mayors rather than the national level or the state. And is this going to work under the current frameworks or is this decentralized corruption? Okay, L let, me, let me take a couple of questions so we get more participation. Do we yeah. have yes? Thank you, Ricardo. Nelson Cunningham with McClarty Associates. Uh, in the waning days of the Obama administration, we're hearing more about the opening toward Cuba. And the administration has touted the opening toward Cuba as having led to a new era of good feeling between Latin America and the United States. That may or may not be overstated. But uh, looking ahead to the Trump administration, who have announced that they would wish to roll back at least some of the opening, and looking at the names of the people who've been floated, uh, who might head Latin American policy, it's quite possible that it will be uh, rolled back. My question for the panel is, uh, how damaging would that be for U.S.-Latin American relations to have that move back? Thank you. Let me get one question over there, and we'll go back to Here's your events. Back, Thank you. Uh, my name is Wei Peng. I work in agribusiness and we source um, a lot of uh, agricultural commodities from the region. And I, my question is for Mr. President uh, of Paraguay uh, because we've seen uh, uh, a slight uh, uh, pickup of uh, deforestation rates in, in some neighboring countries of yours, such as Brazil probably because of the current economic pressures. Uh, while we see in your country, you have managed very well the deforestation rates and you have also achieved an increase in your uh, commodity exports. So do you have any advice for your neighbors on how to balance these two demands and uh, how to better manage their natural resources? Hi, my name is Cynthia. I'm a global shaper from the San Jose Hub in Costa Rica. And I wanted to hear a little bit uh, more about something that Ms. Rebecca Greenspan mentioned about gender equity. We, we're speaking about economic growth for Latin America and the last McKinsey st studies of the power of parity shows that if Latin America uh, mimics at least the, the woman participation that Chile has for 2025, we would have a 14% of GDP growth. And if we manage to close the gap totally, we would have a 34% of, of GDP growth. And also the numbers show that we're having less children in Latin America, more, more women are, are the head of the households. So all the data is showing that economic growth has to do with, with gender. And I would like to know how are we preparing in Latin America? What is our strategy or is, is it just in the, in the hands of nonprofits and the private sector, but how can we be really strategical about this? Uh, very quickly, uh, um, among the long list that has been mentioned, low saving rate of the regions, any ideas on quick fixes for that? Thank you. Okay, so uh, in the last two minutes of this session, I'm <laughs> I'm going to go around once, and I don't want you to answer all of the questions. I just want you to say the most interesting you have to, it's in, interesting you have to say about some of the issues that were raised, about one of the issues that were raised. President, how did you stop the deforestation? Now we have a law, uh, we have law that really uh, takes care very, uh, uh, with much energy. Uh, we used to have a deforestation, but now the, the, we got a ministry that really takes care, and, and you cannot, uh, the, uh, we are divided into two regions in Paraguay. The east side, uh, which is zero deforestation. On the west side, uh, you have to have a permission, and if you don't respect, it's directly jail. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, devolution, decentralization, it is not a panacea. Watch it, pay close attention. Mr. Renzi added to his referendum about the Senate the question of reversing devolution. I think that that is why he lost the referendum, I think. 
Uh, well, there may, may have been other things, but he, he piled up too many things. But this one, he got all the people in the regions and all the governors and all mayors against because, well, obviously, you know, they probably had to disappear in the Senate, but the question of uh, devolution was too much. Now, in Brazil, I remember uh, when uh, 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 Minas Gerais uh, defaulted and uh, Fernando Henrique Cardoso had to uh, put on the lay the responsabilidad fiscal. Uh, now, all of us have legislated somehow that states, municipalities cannot borrow, they cannot borrow in, in foreign currency, but there have been an explosion of local currency and in some cases bankruptcy, virtual bankruptcy of uh, subnational. And the problem with that is that a state cannot say one of my states went bankrupt. Although there isn't a legal obligation, you go there and you fix it and you try to stop it. So in the end, you have to be very careful uh, about the question of uh, decentralization because with decentralization has to come accountability. You cannot have decentralization and forget about it, decentralization about the money, decentralization about the resources. It is about accountability, accountability, because it is still taxpayers' money. It is the taxpayers' money of the, all the country, not all the, or the local. In fact, the local, typically, still in Latin America at least, do very little at raising water, very little at raising land tax, and very little at ra helping the government, the central government, raise the, 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 the federal taxes. So watch it, be careful. Decentralization is not a magic word. It's an only an instrument, and you have to deal with it with caution. Uh, Rebecca, just the most interesting among the questions that were asked. Okay. First of all, let me say how good it is that now in Latin America, we know the names of the judges and prosecutors and not the name of the generals. And that's a huge quality change for the region. Uh, with respect to decentralization, I would say only that uh, the, the, the change from monarchy to feudalism is not progress. <laughs> so we need to really uh, be able to balance having a nation and having accountability at the local level. I think that it's not possible not to go there for more mayor's responsibility and action in terms of political action. Many of the national leaders now come from the local leadership. So it's important to think how to do it well. You know, it's, it's deepening democracy. It's not formal decentralization of power. And I think that that's the difference. Th there is ways to do it well. Eh? Eh, the, the, the second is, eh, eh, I would have liked somebody to take the gender question and not only the woman in the panel. Eh, but I really believe that eh, if, we can, if we don't continue in the gender equity path, eh, we will lose a huge opportunity of talent and possibilities for productivity jumps and for eh, economic growth in the region. And a lot of the informality, a lot of the unemployment that we are seeing, a lot of the poverty we are seeing, has to do with women issues. So let's take the gender equity agenda central to the political discussion, and not like a, an afterthought. After we said everything, then it comes gender. If we do that, we will, we will go a long way. And lastly, I think that really the issue of Cuba is a very important point for the normalization of the relations between Latin America and the US. And what was one of the points where the whole Latin America was on one side and the US was in another. It will be very sad to see uh, that that will go backward. I, I, would, I would like to think that that won't happen. I want to make two points. Uh, one is um, concerning your thing about quick victories or things that can be done quickly or have consequences. I think it's, it's a good moment now to relaunch, re-energize, rethink the Pacific Alliance. That was launched uh, uh, with great uh, effectiveness, I thought. It was one of the very good initiatives in, in terms of integration. It lost momentum and, and interest uh, as different governments came in and, 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 and 
essentially thought that that was the pri pri previous government's problem. But I think that this is high time for that initiative to, to, to be relaunched, re-energize, yes. uh, and, and mobilize again, and perhaps include countries that in the past yes. were very, cr very critical. Uh, Brazil was very critical of the Pacific Alliance. Perhaps with the new government, uh, we, you know, that, that could be, that, that can change. Same with Argentina. So do something uh, with the Pacific Alliance, and that, that, that can be a very interesting point. And my final point, is, uh, uh, it's uh, about something that uh, Mr. Janiot said, uh, and, and also Rebecca echoed, and I want to, to mention it. It's, 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 we need to celebrate the fact that in Guatemala, a president was uh, thrown out of office uh, for corruption in a, following very precise institutional, <laughs> constitutional, legal, measures. In, in the past, that uh, was done, as Rebecca suggested, by the military. There was going to be a military coup. This was done through a, a, a legal process. And the same is happening in, in, in Brazil. The, the initiative, La Vajato and others, are touching the most powerful individuals of that society uh, in the private sector, in the public sector, in government, politicians. And it's being done institutionally and the same in other countries. So there is a very good thing happening that is new, uh, that has not been discussed here in the past that, that we should welcome. And that is the, the, the use of the legal system uh, to, to have transitions of uh, those in power that are corrupt. Okay, well, so we've gone through a, a long set of issues. I, I hope you've uh, seen the diversity of things that are on the agenda of Latin America. And I hope, uh, to see how a lot of progress for next year's Davos on how many new things have been put on the agenda and how many new quick wins have been suggested. You Thank you very me much. Just two words, yeah? please. Uh, it's so true what Moises has said that we are for so many years repeating and repeating mm -hmm. the same uh, problems, the same. And I think what Brazil occurs I'd rather to see the future with optimism, because we always talk about a stronger institution, institutionality. Do you measure what happened in Brazil, really? With the public minister, with the justice? It's really historically. I think that he's not giving us the reason that we are repeating and repeating, because they, they gave an example that is really a message for the world. And again, the, the word efficiency. What are we going to do if we improve our infrastructure? If we improve in, in skills and education, but you are not competitive. Your people travel and go somewhere else. The country has to make the environment to use his people, giving the conditions. It's not, we have to do all that, but we have to create, and, and, and again, we have, you never have to get tired and fighting against this corruption and transparency. It's going to be our angel. Thank you much. Thank you.